Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Forum on the Hill, our first Forum of the, on the Hill for this season. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm Mary Angela, if you don't know the director of the Center on the Hill. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome our first speaker of the season, Thomas Keels. A little bit about him. He is a lecturer, writer, and commenter specializing in Philadelphia history and architecture. He is the author or co-author of seven published books, including Philadelphia Graveyards and Cemeteries, Wicked Philadelphia, Sin in the City of Brotherly Love, and Forgotten Philadelphia, Lost Architecture of the Quaker City. Tom is a contributing writer for the Rittenhouse Square Review, writing monthly articles on Philadelphia landmarks and more. His articles have also appeared in the Chestnut Hill Local, Mainline Times, Springfield Sun, Philadelphia Style Magazine, Germantown Crier, and the Journal of, His of the Historical Society of Montgomery County. His articles on Laurel Hill Cemetery and contractor bosses can be viewed online at the Encyclopedia of Greater Philadelphia. Please join me in welcoming Thomas Keels. Thank you, Marie Angela. Uh, how's the volume level? Good? Okay, good. Um, it's a delight to be here. Uh, my first live appearance here before since uh, February 2020, right before the lockdown. Um, and uh, since I am a recent retiree myself, I've already gone through the catalog and have started picking out all the programs that I want to come see. So I'll be sitting over back there with you. But at any rate, I would like to welcome you all here this afternoon for Franklin's Forgotten Philadelphia, my attempt to recreate the lost city that founding father Benjamin Franklin knew from his arrival here in 1723 until his death in 1790. And this is an outgrowth of a book that I published several years ago called Forgotten Philadelphia, Lost Architecture of the Quaker City, that profiled a hundred or so important buildings in Philadelphia's history that are no longer there. Now, as I'm sure most or all of you know, Benjamin Franklin may be the most remarkable American who ever lived. Uh, historian and biographer Walter Isaacson has called him the most accomplished American of his age and the most influential in inventing the type of society America would become. Now, Franklin has had hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands of biographies and studies, including Ken Burns' 2022 documentary, which you can still see on many of our local PBS stations. But before I launch into the body of my talk, I, I'm going to try to give you a highly condensed biography, sort of a Franklin 101, in case you missed Ken Burns. Um, as a Philadelphia printer, publisher, and author, Franklin is best known for Poor Richard's Almanac and the newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette. Once he made his fortune, he became a major philanthropist, helping to establish such institutions as the American Philosophical Society, the University of Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania Hospital. One of the greatest scientific minds of early America, he is renowned for his electrical experiments, his invention of the lightning rod, the bifocals, and the Franklin stove. And, of course, as a statesman, politician, and diplomat, Franklin is one of the greatest of America's founding fathers. He is the only man to sign the Declaration of Independence, the Treaty of Paris, establishing an alliance with Imperial France, uh, really guaranteeing the survival of America, the Treaty of Paris, which ended hostilities with Great Britain, and finally, the U.S. Constitution. There's been, in the middle front, truly an eminence please. So after a lifetime of accomplishment, he returned to Philadelphia, where he died in 1790. His family plot at Christ Church Burial Ground quickly became a top tourist attraction, so much so that they had to remove the brick wall adjacent to the grave and replace it with a metal grill so that people could stop and look at his grave and pitch pennies on it. And in Philadelphia today, you can't spit without hitting a memorial to or a namesake of Benjamin Franklin. You can take the Ben Franklin Bridge from New Jersey to Franklin Square or go, go south and visit the Benjamin Franklin Museum 
or the Benjamin Franklin Hotel. You can travel further west on the Ben Franklin Parkway, um, stopping at the Franklin Institute. Do I have, come on guys. Sorry, I'm missing a couple of stars here. There we are, the Franklin Institute. Um, and then go down to Franklin Field to see a football game at the University of Pennsylvania. And if you're there during the tourist season, along the way you're sure to run into a dozen or so Ben Franklin reenactors. But for a man whose presence looms over both America and Philadelphia, and who is really in many ways the father of both entities, um, much of Benjamin Franklin's physical world remains a mystery to us. Signs of his physical presence in Philadelphia have vanished almost completely. Now, in part, this is because Franklin was the most fully urban of all of the uh, American pantheon. Uh, he thought the countryside was a great place to visit for scientific experiments or to go for a swim, but he wouldn't want to live there. So while the country estates of men like Washington, Jefferson, John Adams could fester undisturbed until they were restored as historic shrines, the setting of Franklin's abode in a dynamic, fast-growing city, uh, city almost certainly ensured its demolition. Now, Franklin resided at numerous locations in Philadelphia uh, before building his final house at what is now known as Franklin Court. This is a uh, conjecture of what it might have looked like. But if you want to physically see a house where he actually lived, you have to go to London and visit 36 Craven Street, where he lodged frequently between 1757 and 1775. Well, let's recap the official story as told in Franklin's memoirs, later published as his autobiography. Here's 17-year-old Ben on the morning of Sunday, October 23rd, 1723. He's just gotten off the boat from New York, where he had no luck finding work as an apprentice printer after running away from his brother in Boston. He's trudging up Market Street, also known as High Street, from the harbor toward the center of town. He's hungry and exhausted. His pockets are stuffed with extra shirts and stockings. He has one Dutch dollar to his name, and he doesn't know a soul in town. But he looks hopeful, doesn't he? The hungry Franklin asks the boy eating bread where he got it and is directed to a bakery on 2nd Street. After mystifying the baker by asking for the Boston specialties of three penny loaf and biscuit, Franklin finally says, well, what can you give me for three pennies? And in return, he gets three great puffy rolls. Those are his words. Since he has no room in his pocket, he sticks one under each arm and starts eating the other as he trudges further up the street. And along the way, he encounters a young lady uh, standing in a, in a doorway laughing at his ridiculous appearance. According to legend, this was Miss Deborah Reed, who would become Franklin's common law wife in 1730. After touring the town, Franklin returns to market and follows a group of clean-dressed people to the great meeting house of the Quakers near the market. Franklin finds the quiet contemplation of a Quaker meeting perfect for catching a few winks, making the meeting house the first building where Ben Franklin slept in Philadelphia. <laughs> Afterwards, a young Quaker man steers him away from an inn called the Three Mariners, saying it is not a reputable house. The Quaker instead recommends a more respectable inn called the Crooked Billet. Uh, no photo exists of the Crooked Billet. This is how its site appeared in the early 1900s. The next morning, Franklin tidies up and walks to the printing shop of Andrew Bradford at what is now 12 through 18 South 2nd Street. Bradford is Philadelphia's leading printer. He doesn't need any help, but introduces Franklin to another printer named Keimer, whose shop on the 300 block of Market Street consists of an old battered press and one small worn out font of English. But Keimer needs help, so he takes Franklin on and arranges for him to board next door at Mr. Reed's, the home of Laughing Deborah. And the rest 
as they say, is history. Franklin becomes the leading printer in the province, founds libraries, hospitals, fire companies, etc. the mummers, whatever, discovers electricity, tries to defend American interests before the British Crown, signs the Declaration of Independence, and ends up on the cover of Time magazine a few centuries later. So, now that we've uh, given you Franklin 101, let's look at the place where Franklin landed on October 6, 1723. Now, although William Penn had bestowed the official status of city on Philadelphia, it was still a rustic frontier town of about 5,000 inhabitants in 1723. It had already earned the nickname Filthy Dirty for its unpaved streets um, clogged with trash and manure, with dogs and pigs as the only sanitation food. But the city was a busy mercantile port where the agricultural wealth of Philadelphia and Pennsylvania was exchanged for the finished goods of Great Britain. This is the city that Ben Franklin landed in, or at least its southeast prospect, painted by Peter Cooper around 1720. It's a somewhat fanciful interpretation of the city, um, but it does show the major landmarks. At dead center is the Market Street Wharf, where Franklin landed. The city had turned out very differently from the aspirations of its founder, William Penn. This is the original plan as laid out by Thomas Home, Penn Surveyor General, in 1683. At the top is Vine Street, at the bottom is Cedar, today South Street, and these would remain the city's north and south boundaries until 1854, when it was consolidated with the surrounding county. The city is divided into quadrants by its two major thoroughfares, High Street and Broad Street, and each quadrant has its own public square with a large central space meant for civic buildings. In the map, at least, development is evenly spread along both the Schuylkill and the Delaware rivers, moving inward toward the town center. The lots are nice and large so that houses can be sent back with tree-filled yards, reducing the risk of fire and creating a green country town. It's a model of rational age of enlightenment planning. Well, this is Philadelphia in reality or at least a conjectural view of what the city looked like in the early 18th century. Everyone is crowded along the Delaware River. It's the larger of the two rivers and the most direct link to the Atlantic. The town was uh, built up until somewhere around 3rd and 4th Streets, uh, but very few people lived above that pond and left um, in the left rear at the end of Dock Street. Meanwhile, the land along the Stoop Hill was still wilderness, broken by an occasional farm. Now, in the 19th century, this region would become a major industrial thoroughfare, and the Stoop Hill would become an open sewer. But throughout the 18th century, it was still teeming with fish and pure enough to be used for baptisms. Along the Delaware, the city resembled the medieval European towns that William Penn disdained. Although these sketches date from the 1830s, they really show little change from a century earlier. The large lots in Penn's original plan had been bisected by narrow alleys. The resulting small properties were crammed with two and three story brick and wood frame buildings. Those who could afford to live in more spacious dwellings moved further west. In the early 18th century, a 10 minute walk would take you from the Delaware waterfront into the open country. At left is the mansion of Isaac Norris, the Speaker of the Provincial Assembly, in effect the Governor of Pennsylvania, on Chestnut Street between 4th and 5th. This side is now occupied by the old Second Bank of the United States. Below on the right is Clark Hall, a country estate all the way out at 3rd and Chestnut Streets, built around 1694. Um, the mansion would later serve as Alexander Hamilton's treasury office in the 1790s when the capital city had swallowed up the property. When Penn designed Philadelphia, he expected its wealthier inhabitants to imitate the English gentry and spend much of their time at their country estates. He himself lived at Pensbury Manor along the Delaware River in Bucks County and would take a barge down into town when provincial business demanded. 
Um, and if you look north and south on the city grid of the map, most of the small names are the owners of manors. One of the largest country estates was Fairhill, uh, the 800-acre spread of Assembly Speaker Isaac Norris, located in what is now North Philadelphia. It and most of its neighbors were burned by the British in 1777. Beyond the country estates were outlying villages like Germantown and Frankfurt. Many of them were as old or older than Philadelphia and filled with fast-running creeks perfect for mills. These grist mills, like Roberts Mill in Germantown, explained why Franklin was able to get three great puffy rolls for only a penny apiece. Early Philadelphia was the breadbasket of the American colonies. In the early 18th century, a pound of flour cost nine shillings in Philadelphia versus 28 shillings in Boston. Now, let's go back to Philadelphia proper. Originally, the city center had been located around the dock, a natural inlet north of Spruce Street that fed into Dock Creek. The main branch of Dock Creek meandered northwest, ending in a pond roughly on the site of today's Washington Square. The mouth of Dock Creek was where William Penn first landed in Philadelphia in 1682. There was already a small settlement there, clustered around the Blue Anchor Tavern, where, according to legend, Penn stopped for a refreshing draft of ale. Over time, however, Dock Creek fell out of favor. In part, this was due to the breweries, tanneries, and other industries that grew up around it, dumping their waste into the creek and turning it into a sewer. Later in life, Franklin would try to start a movement to clean up Dock Creek, but was rebuffed by local business interests. During the 18th century, Dock Creek would be covered over in stages to become Dock Street, which until the 1950s was Philadelphia's wholesale food district. By the time Franklin landed in 1723, the heart of the settlement had shifted three blocks north to Market and Second, along the 100-foot wide thoroughfare which bisected the city from east to west. Originally called High Street, Market Street took its new name from the market sheds, which appeared at Front Street shortly after the city's founding. Soon, the wooden stalls had uh, stretched up to Second Street, where vendors would sell produce, meat, and crops every Wednesday and Saturday. In 1707, a brick head house was erected at 2nd and High Streets. While its upper story served as the town hall and courthouse, its arched ground floor became the first permanent market building in Philadelphia. Soon, more markets to sheds stretched west of the head house toward 3rd Street. And of course, if you're familiar with head house um, square in 2nd uh, and Pine, then you have some idea of what the original market house and market sheds look like. Shortly before Franklin's arrival in 1723, the town councils began to replace the wooden market stalls with brick arcades designed to harmonize with the town hall. Franklin spent much of his life in Philadelphia, only a few steps away from the market, and was always enamored of it. Perhaps the infatuation of a hungry young man suddenly confronted with blocks of cheap, wholesome food. The market sheds would remain a Philadelphia landmark for over 150 years, stretching as far west as 17th Street before their demolition in the 1850s. They were replaced by large indoor markets, of which today's um, Reading Terminal Market is uh, sort of an outgrowth. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the upper stories of the market headhouse served as the town hall and courthouse the political and judicious nerve center for the city and the province. Public announcements were made from the balcony on the second floor, and during elections, enfranchised freemen would ascend the outdoor staircases to cast their ballots, or they would block them to keep their opponents from casting theirs. Needless to say, this led to a lot of election day battles. Perhaps to avert a future mayhem, the outdoor stairs were removed before the revolution, 
although the balcony remained for public announcements. Franklin probably spent a lot of time in this building. As the official printer for the province, he probably attended assembly meetings regularly when they were head there, held there. The town hall had been built to placate the provincial assembly, which had threatened to leave Philadelphia unless the city built them a suitable and dignified meeting place. Well, surrounded by the smelly, noisy market and subject to frequent political outbursts, Town Hall was not an ideal home. By 1728, the assembly was threatening to move again because of the indecency suggested by rude and disorderly people. By 1732, plans for a new state house had been drawn up to be built on the south side of Chestnut between 5th and 6th. The building, today known as Independence Hall, was first used by the assembly in 1736, the same year that Benjamin Franklin was named clerk of the assembly. The old town hall and courthouse would survive for nearly another century before being demolished in 1837 and replaced with a modern iron market shed designed by William Strickland. Second to Market Streets was also the center of Philadelphia's printing business in the 18th century, so it was natural that Franklin would want to be here. Um, in 1728, only five years after his arrival, and when he was only in his early 20s, he opened his own business, the new printing office at 139 Market Street. The following year, he began to print his newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette there. His neighbors and competitors included Andrew Bradford, Robert Bell, printer of Thomas Paine's Common Sense, John Dunlap, printer of the Declaration of Independence, and Robert Aitken, printer of the first English Bible in North America. As Philadelphia's population increased, a jump in crime made a new prison necessary. The town's first prisons had been small log cabins in the middle of High Street and east of Second. In 1723, the same year as Franklin's arrival, uh, the city unveiled its new prison complex at the southwest corner of Third and Market. As with most other 18th century prisons, conditions were brutal. Rape and violence were commonplace, and hundreds of men and women were crammed together into a few foul rooms. At the same time, the High Street prison wasn't very effective. During its first three years, over 14 convicts um, escaped the prison simply by climbing out of the walls and running away. Um, but it would serve as the town's prison until construction of the Walnut Street Jail was completed in 1776. Philadelphia was becoming a big city with big city problems. Crime, poverty, pollution, political unrest. And Franklin would spend much of his adult life trying to find solutions for these problems. Now, oddly enough, many of the organizations he fostered to solve these problems were born in taverns. And this wasn't because Franklin was a lush, although he did refer to wine as, quote, a constant proof that God loves us and loves to see us happy. <laughs> but in the 18th century, taverns, inns, and coffee shops were where men gathered to exchange news and cut deals. By 1744, there were more than 100 licensed public houses in Philadelphia and over 20 of them were on 2nd Street alone. Of course, this function dated back to the Blue Anchor Tavern, which historian John Watson called the proper key of the city to which all newcomers resorted. The tavern was where goods were traded from all the ships anchored in the dock and fair prices established. In Franklin's day, the London Coffee House at the southwest corner of Market and Front Streets had usurped the Blue Anchor's role. Opened in 1754, its proprietor was the printer William Bradford, nephew of the printer Franklin had approached for work in 1723. The London Coffee House was the city's commercial and financial exchange, where the governor, ship captains, merchants, bankers, and other power brokers would gather each day at noon, each of their regular stalls, to drink and cut deals. Everything was for sale at the London Coffee House. Crops, carriages, horses, houses, 
and human beings. The coffee house hosted frequent slave auctions, which were held under the shelter of its wide wraparound awning. Now the red arrow over on the left is pointing to the Indian King Tavern on the south side of Market between 2nd and 3rd. The Indian King was the closest thing to a luxury five-star hotel that Colonial Philadelphia had to offer. It had kitchens, stables, a staff of servants, and fireplaces in 14 of its 18 rooms. And among the many groups that met there over the years was the Leather Apron Club, or the Junto, although I believe I've heard it was pronounced Junto in Franklin's day. Um, this was a self-improvement society founded by Franklin and a number of his fellow artisans in 1727. They met every Friday to socialize, network, trade books, and discuss current events. And a number of them, like Franklin, would go on to become the city's civic leaders. One block west at 15 South 4th Street was the Indian Queen Tavern, another early five-star hotel. It had five large public rooms on the first floor designed to hold companies, the academic, civil, civic, and fraternal organizations springing up by the dozens in mid-century Philadelphia. And just like convention centers today, innkeepers really competed for this business. It was a lot of business, a lot of men. They were talking a lot. They were getting very thirsty. They were drinking a lot. A lot of them had to stay overnight because they were too drunk to get home. It was a real money maker. So um, the Indian Queen, among other groups, was an early meeting place of the American Philosophical Society, co-founded by Ben Franklin in 1743. And finally, the city tavern seen at left was built by a wealthy group of individuals in 1773 on the west side of Second between Walnut and Chestnut. During the Revolution, Franklin attended meetings of the Committee of Safety here, and among its other guests, numbered Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, John Adams, and the Marquis de Lafayette, who was demolished in the mid-19th century, uh, rebuilt in the 20th for the bicentennial, and sadly, the modern day version closed in 2020 as a victim of the COVID lockdown. Now, people just didn't sit around and drink in colonial Philadelphia. I know I made it sound that way. Religion was also an extremely important part of daily life. And while the Quakers dominated politics and society in early Philadelphia, William Penn's policy of freedom attracted a variety of religious sects. It wasn't complete freedom. Catholics and Jews were not allowed to hold office for many years and Catholics had to work, worship in secret until the construction of St. Joseph's Church, but they were not persecuted actively as they were in some other colonies. In his memoirs, Franklin sort of admitted a somewhat ambivalent attitude toward religion. Quote, though I seldom attended any public worship, I had still an opinion of its propriety and its utility when rightly conducted. In other words, it was good in its place, and frankly, it was an excellent way to network. Now, by 1685, Philadelphia Quakers had constructed their first meeting house on Front Street above Arch. It was called the Bank Meeting because it originally stood on a bank overlooking the Delaware. Um, this is how it appeared in 1702 when it had been rebuilt. But as Philadelphia grew, a larger and more impressive Quaker gathering place was needed near the town center. So in 1696, the great meeting house, where Franklin took his first nap, opened on the southwest corner of Second and Market, across from the town hall. Built at a cost of over 1,000 pounds, the 50 square foot building was the first important public building in the city. Now, the same year that the Great Meeting House was built, Philadelphia's Anglicans built a small wooden chapel on 2nd Street, north of Market. Um, although the Quakers referred to churches like this as steeple houses, you can see that this one didn't even have a steeple. Um, according to one account, it was a lowly structure of wood whose ceiling could be touched with upraised hands and with a bell hung in the crotch of a nearby tree. 
But the battle for political power between those who supported the Penn proprietorship, mostly Quakers, and those who wanted to make Pennsylvania a royal colony, mostly Anglicans, had begun. And the block of Second Street between the meeting house and the chapel was a major battleground. In 1727, the Anglicans began construction on an impressive brick structure around the original chapel. And I'm sure most of you know what the final result was. This is the William Strickland watercolor of Christ Church, showing it in the early 19th century. The church's steeple, which was the tallest point in America for 56 years, was not completed until the 1750s, when it was financed by a successful lottery organized by, would anyone care to venture a guess? Our boy Ben. Needless to say, the Quakers were a little disconcerted to find this Georgian palace of a steeple house rising up the road from their great meeting house. Um, it seemed to emphasize their shrinking size and social status within their own holy experiment. By 1760, Quakers represented less than one-fifth of the population. So they doubled down and they built a greater meeting house. Um, in 1755, the Great Meeting House was pulled down to build the Greater Meeting House, an impressive brick structure that cost over 2,100 pounds. And this was not only the French religious home, but the nerve center for their social and political activities. It would last for half a century until the noise and dirt from the market became too much for the Quakers. In 1803, the property was sold, it was dismantled, and many of the materials were used to build the new Arch Street Meeting House, which still stands today at 4th and Arch Street and is still the home of the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting. Now, I want to go back to Christ Church for just a minute. Franklin did worship here, and his pew number 70 is still marked today, as are the pews used by other national leaders who worshiped at the church. Um, he also supported the church financially, and he and his family are buried at its burial ground at Fifth and Arch. But the main connection between Christ Church and the Franklins was Deborah. The Reed family had belonged to the church, and Deborah attended services there. She had their son, Francis, baptized there in September 1733, significantly when Franklin was out of town and when Francis died of smallpox in 1736, he was the first family member interred in the family plot at Fifth and Arch. The Franklin's daughter, Sarah, was also baptized at Christ Church in 1743. But Franklin's interest in supporting religious freedom went well beyond the Episcopalian Church. In 1788, Mikvah Israel, Philadelphia's oldest synagogue, was raising funds to pay off construction debts for its first synagogue on the north side of Cherry Street at 3rd. Franklin was one of the largest contributors to this fund. Other Gentile subscribers included the scientist David Rittenhouse and Constitution signer Thomas Fitzsimmons. Well, by the 1750s, Philadelphia had benefited from a long period of peace and prosperity growing not only into a thriving port, but the second largest city in the British Empire after Philadelphia. This view of the city from that period shows a number of new towers and spires dotting the horizon, including those for Christ Church and the State House. The city itself had expanded physically with a population of nearly 19,000 by 1760. The waterfront was built up all the way from Vine to Second Streets, with development extending into Southwark below the city and Northern Liberties above it. The city was also reaching inward, and houses were appearing as far <coughs> west as Eighth and Ninth Streets. By this time, Franklin was a man of property and substance, having retired from business in 1748 to devote himself to writing, scientific experiments, and civic affairs. He earned about 2,000 pounds a year. That was what the government, that was what the governor was being paid. Um, and he got even more after he won the postmastership for the, for, the, for the province from Andrew Bradford. 
During this period, he was instrumental in the founding and development of many organizations to benefit his city. Most of these organizations still exist in some form today, most of them by name except for the Union Fire Company, which the Philadelphia Fire Department considers its uh, spiritual um, ancestor. And a few of them, like the Pennsylvania Hospital, are still using their original buildings. Now, looking at the University of Pennsylvania, in 1749, Franklin wrote in his proposals relating to the education of youth in Pennsylvania about the need for a public school. And this resulted in the establishment of the Philadelphia Academy in 1751 on Fourth Street below Arch. The Academy and its accompanying charity school were established in the new building, the church-like uh, structure shown at left. Benjamin Franklin became the first president even though he had less than two years of formal education. Franklin was also responsible for inviting the Scottish academic William Smith to America. Smith would become the first provost of the newly organized College of Philadelphia, graduating its first class in 1757. But suspected of Tory sentiments, the school was besieged during the Revolution, first by uh, radical patriots, and then by the British Army. After the Revolution, it was reorganized and renamed the University of the State of Pennsylvania, gradually becoming the University of Pennsylvania. And upon his return from Europe in 1785, Franklin, Franklin was elected uh, president of the trustees of the university. Excuse me. The university remained at Fourth and Arch until 1800, when it moved to this majestic structure at Ninth and Chestnut. This was meant to be the White House. It was built to persuade George Washington and Congress to keep the national capital in Philadelphia after 1800, instead of moving it down to that miasmal swamp. Spoiler alert, it didn't work. Um, but it did become home to the University of Pennsylvania, and although these buildings were demolished in the 1830s, UP would stay on this site until 1872, when it moved to West Philadelphia. The Library Company of Philadelphia was founded in 1731 as a subscription company, a uh, subscription library by Franklin and other Junto members who pooled their resources to buy books. Books were incredibly expensive, and these were young working men. So this was a way for all of them to get the books they needed to advance in life. Um, from the Revolution until 1800, the library company also served as the Library of Congress. Um, in 1789, it built this stately building on a lot on Fifth Street across from the State House. This was designed by William Thornton, who would later design the first US Capitol. The cornerstone, with text mostly composed by Franklin, was laid on August 31st, 1789. Sadly, he didn't live to see Library Hall open on January 1st, 1791. But in his honor, a marble statue of Franklin in a toga was placed in a niche above the doorway in 1792. By the 1860s, Library Hall contained nearly 100,000 volumes including the 10,000 volumes of the old Loganian Library. But there were concerns about the building's age and flammability. In 1879, it moved to the Ridgeway Building at Broad and Chestnuts. Today, this is the Philadelphia High School for the Creative and Performing Arts. But since many members objected to traveling so far south, Frank Furness designed a branch library at Juniper and Locust, seen in lower right. Um, with the Lazzarini statue of Franklin in its niche, it sort of looked like a cubist version of the original library hall. In 1887, it was replaced by the Drexel Building, which was in turn demolished for Independence National Historical Park. And finally, in 1954, the American Philosophical Society, also founded by Franklin, recreated the 1789 Library Hall on its original site, complete with a replica of the Lazzarini statue of Franklin for its own library. 
Today, the original statue resides indoors at the latest home of the library company, built in 1964 at 1314 Locust Street. Although Pennsylvania Hospital, which calls itself the first public hospital in the country, was the brainchild of Dr. Thomas Bond, it probably would not have succeeded without Ben Franklin. When Bond was trying to raise money for the hospital, he kept going to civic leaders who kept saying, well, what does Ben Franklin think about your idea? And finally he said, okay, I've got to get Ben Franklin on board. Brilliant idea. Franklin organized a petition of leading citizens. He got a bill prepared and pushed it through the provincial assembly and raised over 2,000 pounds to um, bring the uh, foundling institution to life. All this within six months in 1751. Franklin would later note that I do not remember any of my political maneuvers, the success of which gave me at any time more pleasure. When the east wing of the hospital's pine building opened in 1755, Franklin drafted this, this inscription for the building's cornerstone. It was a very positive inscription George II happily reigning, for he sought the happiness of his people. Philadelphia flourishing, for its inhabitants were public spirited. Um, it almost sort of is setting up Philadelphia for a fall. It's like, things can't get any, any, any better than this. It's going to go downhill from there. And of course, it did. Now, I can't um, end without a discussion of perhaps the greatest mystery of all in our search for Franklin his residence in Franklin Court. After 33 years of marriage, Benjamin and Deborah Franklin had lived in 13 rented houses. In 1763, the 57-year-old Franklin had just returned from a stint in England as provincial agent, flush with money. It was time for Ben and Deb to settle down and build their dream house. Now, over the past 30 years, the Franklins had assembled a large lot of land off the 300 block of Market Street. Um, their house was sighted to stand about 200 feet back from the street, and it would be shielded from the noise and crowds by the buildings along the street. Before returning to England in 1764, Franklin conferred with his architect, Robert Smith, and his contractor, Samuel Rhodes. This sketch of the first floor, floor layout, purportedly by Franklin, is one of the few clues we have to the appearance of the house. Franklin incorporated many of his own inventions into the house's design, including lightning rods and Franklin stoves. He returned to London shortly afterward, leaving Deborah in charge of construction. The two kept up a busy correspondence with Franklin demanding to know the latest details and Deborah struggling to keep them informed. Meanwhile, Franklin kept shipping a steady stream of new possessions home for his dream house. Fine china, silver, and fabrics that were still difficult to obtain in Philadelphia, as well as some portraits of himself, so Deborah could remember what he actually looked like. A 1766 insurance survey described the finished house as a three-story brick structure, 35 feet square, with three floors to a room and a basement kitchen. Franklin would not lay eyes on his house until he returned home in May 1755, um, 1775, excuse me, when the schism between America and Great Britain was growing irreparable. His wife, Deborah, whom he had not seen for over a decade, had died the previous year. Franklin barely had time to settle a few bills, sign the Declaration of Independence, before he was off to Europe again, this time for France in October 1776 to persuade Louis XVI to support the American cause. While Franklin was in France, the British occupied Philadelphia from October 1777 to June 1778. His daughter Sarah, who had given birth to a daughter herself only a few days earlier, was forced to flee when Franklin's beautiful new house was taken over by Captain John Andre aide de camp to Commanding Officer General Sir William Howe. When Andre left in June 1778, he took along a few souvenirs, including much of Franklin's library, 
valuable musical instruments and scientific equipment, and a portrait of Franklin shown here. Andre's descendants would eventually return the portrait in 1906, and today it hangs in the White House. In 1785, with the revolution over, Franklin returned home. Although widowed, he was hardly alone. His daughter Sarah, her husband Richard Bache, and their seven children now lived at Franklin Court with him. Franklin was now the president of Pennsylvania, in effect the governor, so Franklin Court was busy with political meetings and meetings of all of his different associations. To accommodate all this, Franklin added an addition to the east side of his house, providing enough room for his family while giving himself more space for his rebuilt library and scientific collections. Able to supervise the new construction in person, he lavished attention on details that would provide comfort and aid in his old age. He installed a special round tepid bath in his bathroom, it seen it left, with a new type of heating system and even taps for both hot, hot and cold water. His library featured the chair at right with a concealed ladder under the seat. Franklin even developed an early book hook for um, getting books off of high shelves. Franklin was able to enjoy his dream house for five years before dying in 1790 at the age of 84. He was laid to rest at Christ Church next to his wife and son after a funeral attended by 20,000 mourners. Shortly after his death, his daughter and son-in-law sold many of his possessions at auction. They rented out his house, and over the next decade, it served as a boarding house, a female academy, a coffee house, and home of the African Free School. After the Beish's death, the Franklin House was sold and demolished in 1812, and Oriana Street was run through the property. In 1954, the federal government acquired the site of Franklin's home as part of Independence National Historical Park. After conducting extensive research, the National Park Service decided to recreate Franklin Court for the nation's bicentennial. The well-documented properties on Market Street were reconstructed as the United States Postal Museum, the Franklin Print Shop, and the Office of the Aurora, a newspaper edited by Franklin's grandson. But aside from the two rough sketches attributed to Franklin, no authentic image of his house existed on which to make a reconstruction. The only known picture of the house in early 19th century watercolor vanished around 1948. This hypothetical design was based on insurance records and other historical documents. It was prepared at the, uh, in, during the 1950s for the National Park Service. Finally, faced with this lack of historical documentation, the architects, John Milner, Robert Venturi, and John Rauch, opted not to try and recreate the actual residence. Instead, they designed ghost houses open steel frames outlining the dimensions of the Franklin House and a nearby print shop. Franklin Court opened to the public in 1976, just in time for the bicentennial. Beneath the ghost houses, an underground museum presented a multimedia history of Franklin's life and contributions. Portholes on the top level allowed visitors to look down at excavations of the remaining foundations, cellars, and privy pits. The rest of the courtyard was developed as a small urban park with plantings, pergolas, and benches, evoking the 18th century garden which Franklin had laid out with grass plots and gravel walks, with trees and flowering shrubs, in his own words. There, the elderly statesman enjoined entertaining visitors while sitting beneath a giant mulberry tree. And that's where we will leave Ben Franklin and his friends and families, relaxing under his tree in a now vanished Philadelphia, while we go back out the archway to Market Street and the 21st century. Thank you very much.
have time for any questions. If there are any questions or any comments people want to add, please feel free to go ahead. Yes. Um, I think, first of all, Franklin was devoted to the idea of a polyglot society. He really did want Philadelphia to be a place where everyone could succeed. He may very well have known members of the congregation through his businesses, um, through his uh, different organizations and things like that. Um, and I think it was really just sort of reaching out to his fellow citizens. Franklin. I think what Isaacson said about Franklin really helping America to become the society that it became, or rather I think this is a society that we wish it had or that it would become or is, is becoming, um, as a society where all groups are accepted, where there is fluidity, um, people can grow and change and develop and go from being a poor little printer boy to becoming the greatest, perhaps the greatest American ever. Thanks for your question. But yes, sir. Uh, how did Ben Franklin uh, make a living when he was out of the country? Um, by the time that he was departing for England and France, Franklin was pretty much independently wealthy. Um, he, you know, a penny saved is a penny earned, and he followed that maxim. So while he was working, he, you know, spent his money very carefully. Um, he invested it very carefully. Also, while a lot of the other founding fathers were busy sinking every cent they had into very expensive plantations um, that really bankrupted them, he and Deborah were still living in rented houses. They were living on a fairly modest scale. So, um, as I mentioned, after his retirement, he was earning about 2,000 pounds a year, which was what the governor of the province was um, you know, being paid. So that was a vast sum of money, and that was enough to support him, um, but also to support um, Deborah and his family while he was gone. Also remember that much of the time he spent in Europe before the revolution was at, uh, as the provincial agent for Pennsylvania. He also ended up representing a, a couple of other colonies at the court of St. James, advancing their business interests, making connections, um, things like that, encouraging investment in the new world. And that paid him a very nice fee as well. So. I, I think Franklin was probably not hurting for money at any time of his life. Yes, ma'am. Yes, and I did. I, I made reference to that, but I, I didn't want to keep you folks here all afternoon. But uh, Franklin and other members of the Junto, and again, one thing to remember is that Franklin may have been the leading force, but he always worked with other people, usually a lot of people that he met from his Junto days, but he was always afraid of fire in the overcrowded business section, and after a fire almost took out the harbor in 1730, he and the other Junto members um, formed the Union Fire Company, which for many years, and this was revolutionary because not, it, it, it would put out any fire in Boston and other cities, you had to pay a fee, and if you weren't a member of the company, sorry, you're, you know, we're just going to let you work. We'll, we'll, we'll water down the house next door where a member lives, but you're, you're up in smoke. And this was for everybody in Philadelphia. So today, the Philadelphia Fire Department does consider him their, their founding father as well. He also founded the, uh, co-founded the Philadelphia Contribution Ship. Um, I forget the entire title, but basically it was the first property and casualty insurance company in America, and they still exist today. Thanks for your question. Okay.
thank you all so very much for being here. Thank you, Tom. That was incredibly fascinating. I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, I want to welcome you all to uh, please come back next month. We have Paul Civitz here who's going to talk about the Puritans. I also do have in the back a few of Tom's books, as well as you can search Thomas Keels on Amazon and find a lot of his fabulous writing. So I encourage you to do that. If you're interested in one of those books, just see me. And please stick around, help yourself to refreshments. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Tom.